and have fun. And have fun. Okay, so we're live on HowlRound. Hold, now. hold, yes, hold your, hold that thought. Holding it. And. And we're recording now. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brenda Muñoz and I am the conference coordinator. Uh, I am happy to welcome you all to the Playwrights Under the Radar session hosted by Brian Moore. Uh, this presentation will be in mostly in English, but some will be in Spanish. So remember to just download the Oral Simultaneous Interpretation app Web Switcher Pro and uh, the volunteers will add that token, the access token, to that on the chat box. Uh, hola a todos, mi nombre es Brenda Muñoz, coordinadora del Congreso de LMDA. Me da gusto recibirlos en el panel Dramaturgistas en el Radar. Este panel va a ser en su mayoría en inglés, pero tiene algunas presentaciones en español. Así que recuerden que tenemos acceso a interpretación simultánea a través del Web Switcher Pro, una app que pueden descargar en sus teléfonos, y en el chat box van a poner el link o token de acceso. Uh, muchas gracias a todos los presentadores por estar aquí. Thank you very much to all the speakers. I will leave it to you, Brian. Great. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda, for the introduction and for all your work over this uh, weekend um, and last couple of years, I guess. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for being here. On behalf of the um, executive committee, uh, welcome to the 2021 LMDA virtual conference, whether this is your first session or your third uh, of the day. And uh, welcome to this year's Playwright Under the Radar session. Uh, LMDA would like to thank uh, HowlRound for live streaming the session and also thank the um, online playwriting resource page by page for sponsoring this session. We appreciate their support. Uh, I'm Brian Moore. I'm the president of LMDA. Uh, I am based in the ancestral lands of the Pawnee and the Sioux, currently known as Seward, Nebraska, but I am attending this week's conference on the current and ancestral homeland of the Ojibwe and the Dakota, also known as Bemidji, Minnesota. Um, I'm excited to share this uh, presentation and these presenters uh, with you as they share some of their favorite playwrights with you um, through this uh, Playwrights Under the Radar session. Um, if you're familiar um, with our Hot Topics format, which we've been doing for quite a while, um, we use a similar format where each presenter will get a maximum of five minutes to share their playwright or playwrights with us. Um, one of our volunteers will be keeping time, so they'll have an idea of um, when they are running out of time and when they need to stop. So we will hope they respectfully do so. Um, and we will plan to uh, share contact information about the playwrights um, on the conference hub for future reference. They may mention some info during the presentation, but it'll be there at a later time and date as well. At the end of our presentations, uh, we will have time to take any questions from the audience or from each other if they have questions about each other's work uh, and writers. Um, and we'll also welcome the audience to share any additional names of playwrights and info that they want to share with us. Feel free, free to um, post those either in the Q&A or in the, uh, any chat, um, chat functions that you have available. Um, finally, we will conclude the session uh, with a special announcement from LMDA. So I will leave it at that. And um, so please stay tuned for that. Um, uh, as Brenda mentioned, uh, we will have presentations in both English and Spanish. So uh, LMDA okay. attendees uh, will be able to listen to the translations of each uh, through the Web Switcher app. Um, there's um, and there will be um, there's more information on the conference hub. All right. If there is nothing else, uh, let us go ahead and begin with our first presenter, um, who is the consulting dramaturg at Coalescence Theater Project, um, Anne Marie Dittman. Thanks, Brian. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the um, Kickapoo um, and uh, Ottawa people, uh, which is uh, colonially known as Bloomington, Illinois. And uh, I am here today to talk to you about Amy Tofty. So I am going to share that with you now. Is that sharing? Can you let me know if that's sharing? It is not. It is not. Let me try that again. Now is it sharing? Yes, just loading. Yes. But yeah. All right. Yay. Yes. All right. Um, Amy Tofty is a playwright and screenwriter. Her play Righteous Among Us was a finalist for the 2020 Wood, uh, Woodward and Newman Playwriting Award and won the 2020 Todd McNerney um, Playwriting Award. Her play Cardboard, Cardboard Castles Hung on Walls was a semifinalist for the 2021 Bay Area Playwrights Festival. Her most recent uh, live production was her sci-fi thriller, uh, Women of 4G, which uh, was premiered by Chicago uh, Babes in, with Blades in 2019. And her work has been presented and developed throughout the United States, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, she's a member of the Dramatist Guild and holds a BA from the University of Iowa and an MFA from Cal Arts. In her artist statement, she says, I write plays that center on female characters and experiences. I reclaim male dominated genres and stories and spaces for women. I'm currently exploring female villains. Um, and I'm also trying not to kill so many characters. One of the things I like most about Amy is her extraordinary sense of humor, both in person and in her writing. I first became uh, familiar with Amy's uh, playwriting during the fall of 2019 when I was asked to serve as the, on the selection committee for Coalescent Theater Project's new play festival, which took place uh, in early February of 2020. Coalescent Theater Project is a small non-equity theater in Bloomington, Illinois, uh, which focuses on producing new works for underrepresented voices. Hearts and Pieces is a new work um, which uh, centers on two estranged siblings, Parker and Melissa, who meet face-to-face -face in the presence of a mediator to negotiate the settlement of their inheritance. But in a small town, Parker, um, who uh, is transitioning uh, to gender neutral, wants to use their proceeds from the estate for transformative top surgery, and their sibling Mel is reluctant to comply. But what initially appears to be a simple case of petty bigotry is revealed to have deeper and more painful roots. As the siblings unpack decades of misunderstandings and resentments, they begin to build a new relationship um, something uh, sometimes comically revolving around perceptions of body image and the presence or absence in one form or another of breasts. Amy is um, a passionate artist and generous collaborator, which earned her a place on the Playwrights Advisory Board for Coalescence Theater, a new initiative for that um, organization. I have links to the other playwrights um, for uh, and their NPX profiles 
on the final slide for this presentation, and I recommend that you take a look at those as well. I think you'll find them um, also uh, as interesting as Amy. During the 2020 season for Coalescence Theater, uh, Amy's play Righteous Among Us was chosen for a full production for Coalescence, but due to the pandemic, it was it had to be presented as a Zoom production. I, su I served as the dramaturg for that show. Righteous Among Us is an emotionally charged play that asks the question, is a comforting lie more important than an uncomfortable truth? In Righteous Among Us, a researcher at a civil rights uh, museum is researching um, workers who saved Jews during the Holocaust, as well as families of survivors. But when she discovers that one of the uh, one of the resistance family stories is a lie. She must not only break the news to all involved and shatter the myth, but also come to terms with her own need to find heroes with good intentions among regular people. Unfolding like a suspenseful mystery, each character must make difficult moral decisions which impact their standing in the community and the way history is recorded which leads to another question that the play raises. Can we really truly know history? Amy's characters are complex individuals exploring difficult situations and facing them with humor, tenacity, and humility, revealing a compassion and grace that most of us hope that we have when we face conflict. One of the things I appreciate most about Amy is her unique voice and perspective. Her intelligence and vivid imagination encompasses a wide range of subjects and viewpoints, just as her language and characters explore a variety of tones and experiences and genres. Her plays and characters are intricate and nuanced, and that is what makes them rewarding to both watch and produce. Her social conscious is um, both compassionate and comes from genuine beliefs and personal experiences. And I look forward to working with her again in the near future. And you can too have the pleasure of working with her. Amy Tofty's plays are available on the new play exchange as are um, other uh, writers that work with Coalescence Theater Project. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Look forward to um, looking up Amy's work. Appreciate it. All right, um, let us move on to our next presenter, um, who is Lourdes Guzman Gonzalez. Hi, Brian. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I am very glad to be here and. Since I panic when I try to improvise, I'm going to be reading everything. I'm going to let you know when my actual presentation starts. I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, mi nombre es Lourdes Guzmán González. Uso el pronombre ella. Soy parte del equipo fundador de LMDA México y egresada del Colegio de Literatura Dramática y Teatro de la UNAM. Les saludo desde la Ciudad de México, que ha sido construida a lo largo del tiempo por todas las comunidades indígenas y pueblos originarios que la han habitado, como los mixtecos, zapotecos, tepanecas, triquis, ñañús, mazaguas, nahuas y mazatecos, así como por familias que migran, eh, generalmente del sur al norte, y terminan por establecerse aquí, herederos de imperios europeos, esclavos de África y Asia, refugiados de las Américas, Europa y Medio Oriente en busca de asilo político, económico y religioso, es decir, una gran mezcla cultural. Now I'm starting my presentation. Hoy quiero presentarles una visión general del trabajo de Javier Márquez. Empezaré con un resumen de su semblanza. Javier Márquez es teatrista transmedial, pensador, docente, miembro fundador de Editorial Antropófagos, director artístico de Disecciones Teatro, miembro del colectivo interdisciplinar Haptolab, eh, ha ganado muchos premios, entre los que destacan eh, el Premio Nacional de Dramaturgia Joven, Gerardo Mancebo del Castillo, en 2012, eh, y la medalla Gabino Barreda. Conocí a Javier en la licenciatura 
Es el maestro más joven que he tenido y uno de los más exigentes con quienes he estudiado. Y pienso que esta exigencia la tiene consigo mismo al crear. Más allá de los muchos reconocimientos que ha tenido, lo que me parece más valioso de su trabajo es su permanente búsqueda de expansión de posibilidades expresivas, apoyándose en otras disciplinas y medios. Él llama a esto desde limitar la dramaturgia. Como dramaturgista me parece que este espectro infinito es fascinante, pues su imaginación se manifiesta en maneras más amplias y flexibles que, la, que, la escritura, que las que la escritura hace posible comúnmente durante la concepción de un universo. La materialización específica de todas estas infinitas posibilidades se vuelve exponencial. En 2007, Javier fundó la editorial Antropófagos junto con sus entonces compañeros de escuela, eh, Laura García, Mónica Perea e Iván Arismendi, que en paz descanse. Todos estudiantes de dramaturgia del Colegio de Literatura Dramática y Teatro de la UNAM que querían empezar ya a publicar sus textos para dar a conocer la dramaturgia joven mexicana. Se volvieron un colectivo de, que concibe la dramaturgia como el diseño de experiencias. Comparten esta concepción con otros dramaturgos, como por ejemplo su actual colega Laura Muñoz y otros colaboradores de la época más reciente de la editorial que tienen el objetivo de difundir dramaturgia contemporánea alternativa. Su concepción actual de la dramaturgia implica una expansión a otras disciplinas y a otros medios, por lo que invitaron a más artistas con quienes han ido reflexionando y poniendo en crisis el quehacer de la dramaturgia, y han aprovechado la plataforma digital para darle a cada texto el espacio necesario para su pensamiento debido y en constante expansión. Pienso que el trabajo de Javier se distingue por un punto de vista desacomodado a propósito, por una postura disidente, una inconformidad no disimulada. Retoma las figuras de celebridades, de personajes a cuyas reputaciones ya estamos predispuestos de seres mitológicos cuyas historias marcaron a la humanidad y los lleva al escenario desde otro ángulo. En 2015, tuve la suerte de ver su pieza Jim Morrison, o mejor dicho, de asistir al, al concierto que él, con la colaboración de Laura Muñoz, escenificó al encarnar al rockstar que le da título a la obra. Desdibujando el escenario, mezclando apelaciones directas al público y largos monólogos en los que parecía sumido en un trance, Consiguió que los espectadores fuéramos al mismo tiempo sus fanáticos, sus compañeros en un bar, invitados a la misma fiesta que él, testigos de su decadencia y acompañantes en su transformación en el famoso Rey Lagarto o Lizard King. Esta es una de mis obras favoritas creadas por él porque fue la primera en la que sentí que los espectadores dejábamos de serlo al estar inmersos en la misma situación que el personaje al verdaderamente acompañarlo en su travesía. En marzo pude ver virtualmente la lectura de Vampir, que engloba una pe un peculiar interés por los vampiros, que yo también comparto, además de una exploración del uso del lenguaje, práctica común en su trabajo, mediante la que busca explorar los juegos que se pueden hacer con la percepción. La obra Vampir eh, recorre la historia de los vampiros de todo el mundo, eh, incluye folclore, leyendas viejas, y manifiesta eh, también cómo se han representado con los íconos musicales más famosos del siglo pasado. Sus presentaciones se alejan de lo tradicional, son eventos inmersivos, eh, pretenden involucrar al público de diferentes maneras. Los invito a sumarse a la página editorial antropófagos.com, donde está publicada la mayor parte del trabajo de Javier y la de muchos otros dramaturgos. Eh, todos los materiales son de descarga gratuita y pues antropófagos dicen que quieren diálogo y quieren conversación. Creo que lo que destaca del trabajo de Javier es que en su poética equilibra contenidos que mezclan gustos totalmente personales y una perspectiva crítica con, sobre nuestro contexto con la permanente búsqueda de formatos y técnicas transdisciplinarios que complementen, complementen y permitan abordar dichos contenidos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Flores. All right, uh, let us move on to our next presenter, who is Brad Rothbart. Brad. My, yes, I'm here. Hi, everybody. 
I'm Brad Rothbart. I'm a freelance dramaturg and a maker of hopefully good trouble. My pronouns are they, them, and I need to acknowledge that I'm working on the unceded lands of the, of the Lenapo kink, currently known as Philadelphia PA by its conquerors. I have thinning brown hair, brown eyes, and brown oval glasses. My face is oval as well, and I have a white soul patch. I'm wearing a pink shirt with white squares. I'm sitting in a black faux leather chair at a roll top wooden desk. Behind me is a white wall. I'm about to start presentation. Amazon, set of five minute shot timer. Onward. Shot timer, five minutes, starting now. Today, I'd like to discuss the work of two playwrights who deserve our attention. Hagen Bryce Walker, he Welcome him. To your left surprise. Amazon, stop. Who deserve our attention? Hagen Bryce Walker, he him, and A.A. A. Brenner, they them. One, Hagen Bryce Walker, H A Y G E N hyphen B R I C E space W A L K E R. I'll let him speak for himself in defining his plays. Hagen Bryce's work is like if Streetcar Named Desire, Mean Girls, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Beloved got shit-faced at a Buffalo Wild Wings happy hour and then stumbled into the neighborhood bathhouse while belting the soundtrack of In the Heights. The piece of Hagen Bryce's I'd like to discuss is Wolf Crush, a queer werewolf play. An honorable mention for the Relentless Award in 2018, Wolf Crush is a fully mature work. Walker takes what seems to be a fairly slim set of premises, falling in love with for the first time in high school, livestock mysteriously being slaughtered, a coke-addled school principal, werewolves, and Mariska Hargitay, and turns it into an epic about identity, discovery, and ostracism. Reading it, there were multiple times I felt he had written himself into a corner, only to discover that what looked like a wall was actually a door to an entirely new level of the work. It's a truly remarkable achievement and one of the 10 best plays I've read in the last five years. And I've read a lot of plays in the last five years. Equally important for those of you who produce work is the fact that Walker knows who his audience is, writes for them, and gets them to show up. Ask me at the conference bar how I know this. It's a fascinating story. If you wonder how to get the next generation into the theater, here's your answer. Hagen Bryce serves as his own agent and can be reached at HaganBriceWalker at gmail.com. All one word, all lowercase, no hyphen. Two, A.A. A. Brenner. A period, A period, B-R-E-N-N-E-R. -E -N -N -E this one is personal. For much of my life, I have identified variously as Jewish, non-binary, and disabled, as I have cerebral palsy. AA identifies variously as Jewish, queer, non-binary, and disabled as they have cerebral palsy. AA Brenner writes the plays I needed in the world when I was in my 20s. I'd like to let them speak about the work for a moment. I, I don't just write plays about disability or queerness. I write plays that are inherently ontologically disabled and queer. This results in plays with disabled characters played by disabled actors where disability is never mentioned. Because disabled writers are still writing disability into existence, every piece that touched upon the subject either positions it as the subject of the work, this is me, not, not, not AA, a recurring theme in the work or the center of the disabled character's existence. Brenner's approach to a gigantic step forward. On to the work itself. AA is a still developing playwright whose work is becoming fuller and more nuanced with each new script. Their newest work, Blanche and Stella, a sequela, is a modernized queer, is a quote, modernized queer disabled adaptation of a streetcar named Desire with no cis white men, end quote. It's a radical revisioning of Williams' work with the central premise being that the two women were not actual sisters, but rather extremely close friends. Their last three works have been this radical adaptation, a light comedy, and a neo-absurdist short play, and each work shows a full understanding of that particular form. Unlike Walker, 
who, while centralizing the text, makes the play part of a larger event. For Brenner, the script is the thing. The writing is crisp and thick with each word exactly where it needs to be. AA has been shortlisted and announced as a finalist for numerous awards, including the Larg Apothecary Fellowship, and they have not yet graduated from their MFA program at Columbia University. They are so far ahead of any curve that it is ridiculous. If you want to produce a play by a disabled playwright, and you should, A.A. Brenner is the one. A.A. is represented by Chris Till at Verve. Email ctill at v-e-r-v-e-t-l-a dot com. Phone number 212-506-0750. However, Your they are, timer is done. Amazon stop. However, they are still extremely interested in enlarging the non-binary and disabled theater communities. Therefore, if and only if you identify as non-binary and or disabled, you may contact me privately for their personal email. See. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is Jackie Goldfinger. Jackie. No sound, Jihei. Hey, Jihei, there's no sound. Yeah. Hello, this is Jacqueline Goldfinger bringing you some great new playwrights to check out. I was lucky to meet Zandra when she was finishing her MA in theater from Villanova University right outside Philadelphia. Um, I really enjoyed her as a person. I thought she'd be a wonderful collaborator. I made a note to work with her one day. Um, and then when I read her plays, they floored me. They're sophisticated and vibrant. They were powerful and thoughtful. Uh, she has a background in history and in cultural critique. And so all of her plays were layered with historical and cultural intersectionality that bloomed and that also banged into one another and made the characters come into some really deep, complex, interesting conflict. Zandra writes that she actively grounds her work in the voices of her community, Black people and the African diaspora, Latinx folks, and spaces of queer expansion. She calls herself an optimistic and curious polymath. She thought she would grow up to be a human rights lawyer, and she is now a human rights artist. Her work blends adaptation with revolution, dreams with history, pain with power, laughter with rage. I encourage you to check out her work on the New Play Exchange. Rachel is the unexpected laugh that you get at a dinner party when someone has accidentally said something very truthful. Her writing is complex. Her characters are likable and hateable and everywhere in between on the spectrum, often within the same play. And she is fearless in going to the heart of an issue and making you really look at what is happening with the characters behind the mask. Rachel writes that she writes plays about complicated, complex women of color. These women are neither saints nor villains. They are eternally both. The women are intelligent, blistered, and most importantly, real. As these women navigate through the American landscape with a series of different issues, they also struggle with the complicated idea of what it means to be a woman today. And layered complexity adds 
to their various dilemmas. She uses her play, she writes, to invite the audience into her world using humor and creating a recognizable world. We sit together, we drink together, and we live in these spaces together. My work challenges what these spaces can accept and what absolutely must change so that the room where it happens can be increasingly more inclusive. Jarrett is the most emerging of our emerging writers for this Under the Radar session. His voice is warm and wonderful and understands pop culture, but also understands the layer of history and time and culture that led to this pop culture moment. Keep your eye on him. He's going to do great things for the American theater. Jarrett says that his work will always be about Black queer people in order to normalize the idea of our stories through life being captivating and relatable. And his goals are to write for stage, television, and comic books. Keep an eye out. He's going to blow your mind, folks. I've been participating in Playwrights Under the Radar for 10 years now, so I thought we'd look back and check in with some of our writers from the past. Thank you very much, Jackie. It was great to see some new people and some recaps of some older, um, some previous uh, playwrights uh, from the radar, if you will. So I um, so appreciate your assistance and um, you know, shared a lot there in those five minutes, so appreciate it. All right, um, our next presenter is David Geary. David. Kia ora, ko Taranaki tuku iwi and Ngāri Pākehā. I am from the Indigenous Nation of the Māori of New Zealand, and I am also European. I'm hoping that this is sharing now, and I'm going to start from the beginning. Can someone tell me if that's working? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind. Kim Sinclair Harvey is Silix and Chakotan, and she has written a play called Cam Luca, which is called An Indigenous Matriarch Story. So I wanted to showcase her and this play, Cam Luca, but I'm going to show you way too much information for five minutes. So you can get this PowerPoint off me if you want it. What Cam Luca is, is about three women who go to a powwow. I would encourage you all to go to a powwow. And uh, this is the Cam Looper powwow. It's very big and kids are invited and you can learn how to throw horns properly. And it, one of the great things about powwow now is they're getting uh, a lot of two-spirit people involved in them as well. She's not so much under the radar anymore because she won the Governor General's Award. And in her speech, she said she wanted to write women who are full and funny and sexy and the judges also agreed that it was subversive and irrelevant, uh, irreverent and brilliant. Uh, one of the things that happened while she won was that 215 graves unmarked were found of Indigenous children at Kamloops. So Canada as a whole is going, oh my goodness, what is going on here? 
not everyone in the indigenous community, everyone knew about these things. But um, I wanted to say this became a huge thing for Kim because people started asking, and here's an example of an American graveyard at schools. But Kim was asked, like, is this a time to be celebrating? And she said, you know what? Personally, I will not let the failures of white people steal any more indigenous joy. And Kim is all about joy. Her plays are very joyful. And here are some of the things. One of the matriarchs in her own family is big to her is her mother, who said that she won't watch the plays unless they are capital F funny. Uh, Kim's background is she did a lot of work uh, as an actor and ended up with what she calls cry, die, trauma, drama. And she decided that there needed to be more stories about joy. And this play is very joyful. It has a great designer. Uh, she's also a fire creator, uh, which means that she also takes responsibility for the well-being of all the people in their cast. And she actually creates moments on stage where people can get together and have a uh, connection during the plays. So a lot of what I found when I discussed these women was that they had big political manifestos and ethics as well. Here she is, Kim actually is good at getting theatres to write a treaty with her now. And so I'm not going to get you to read all that, but she has a treaty with Citadel Theatre. This is her new show, Break Horizons. Uh, and she also is using a great Indigenous designer who I'd ask you to follow called Scarlet Delirium. One of the things I wanted to do is like Yolanda Bunnell is one of the women who's in the show, but she's also a great writer herself. And she is interesting. She only wants Indigenous reviewers to review her work. She welcomes you at the door and she talks a lot about carrying emotional weight with her audiences. Quilemia Sparrow is a person who's worked as uh, with a Kim as her director. This is one of her shows. And she created the Pipeline Project, which uh, I would ask you to check out, which also had speakers in the second half, like from the community speaking. Lindsay Lachance, I'd encourage you to all to get in touch with. She did her PhD on Indigenous dramaturgy. Lisa Ravensbergen as well, started the Anti-Racist Canadian Theatre Exchange. Margot Kane, we were talking at lunchtime about what is a matriarch. Uh, runs the talking stick in full circle. Uh, and some of you may know Monique Mohika and her work. I also wanted to do a shout out for Fallon Johnson, who does CBC podcasts. I'm getting my one minute warning. Thank you. This is Nyla Capontier, who does Powwow Boot Camps, which are really fun and is doing an excellent play called Dick's Section of a Mixed Heritage Woman coming up. And then Tara Bagan, who you will have seen at other. LMDA conferences, I would ask you to check out. Yvette Nolan, Renelta Aluk working at the BAP Center, Santi Smith doing these great dance shows, and Raven John representing the Two Spirit Trickster World. And also, I know you did computer games yesterday, Dr. Elizabeth Laponce. So you can follow me and you can follow Kim. I would just say follow Kim. And you can actually get my Indigenous Dramaturgy Guide too if you write to me. I'll put my I put my email in the chat. Uh, stay curious, as Mark Fly said about Canada. There's a lot of amazing women and matriarchs, matriarchs in the making, really doing great things. Thank you to all the grandmothers, mothers, aunties, and sisters out there, and Kiora and Heitka, everyone. Thank you, David. Appreciate all the playwrights you shared and all the artists and you shared. And it's wonderful information there. Thank you. That's all right. Please do get in touch if you want any of that information. I will personally be getting in touch with you, um, but yeah, we will uh, try to share some of that information on our conference hub as well. Um, so um, we'll do what we can to make that happen as well. Thank you, David, for contributing and your willingness to share more. So, all right. Um, our next presenter is Susanna Bazillion. Susanna. Thanks, Brian. I'll bring this up as soon as I can. Hopefully. All right. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Blended. I just pre-recorded this, so I'm going to 
I'll let it run. Whenever it's someone wants the best ideas come to you and you're involved in something else, like taking a shower. On a surface level, your brain is occupied with the mundane tasks of rinsing, lathering, and repeating, and all of a sudden, the subconscious is free to make connections it wouldn't have made if you were actively looking at them. It's like the parable of stories of Newton getting hit on the head with an apple, and suddenly everything clicks, and he formulates laws of gravity, or, or Archimedes stepping into the bathtub, and when seeing the water rise around him, puts it together that the water he displaced must be the same as the volume of his submerged body. Eureka! If you were simply living, watching an everyday process, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it all comes together. Click. Inspiration. The shower principle. Those are the words of Ariel Mitchell, playwright, book writer, lyricist, and screenwriter. This was an excerpt from her latest work, a parenting podcast play called The Shower Principle. It's a two-person series featuring a young couple engaging in life's greatest experiment, parenthood. They navigate their new, unsteady world while finding what they can really hang on to. Ariel has written several other plays, including Give Me Moonlight. It's a play inspired by Scotty's Castle in Death Valley. Another play is A Second Birth. A story about an Afghan girl who was raised as a boy but must then marry a man, from which Ariel was awarded the KCACT F. Harold and Mimi Steinberg 2013 National Student Playwriting Award. Ariel was also named a New Musical Inc. 2017 New Voices Project finalist and has been featured in several developmental opportunities, such as the 2018 Apples and Oranges Arts Theatre Accelerator. The Dramatist Guild 2017 Baltimore Footlights Reading Series, 2016 Artists Fight Midrash Group, Prospect Theatre Company's Fall 2015 Musical Theatre Lab, and the Catwalk Residency Program. Ariel's ability to translate her keen observations into dramatic text began in her sophomore year of high school. She then earned her BA in playwriting with a minor in music in 2013 from Brigham Young University. While there, she earned third place for the 2013 David Mark Cohen Award and the 2011 Vera Hankley Mayhew Award. She then obtained an MFA in musical theater writing from the Tisch School at New York University. She has been published with Samuel French and had a production with THML Theatre Company in 2019. A visit to Ariel's website reveals an array of full-length and 10-minute plays, plus musicals she has written and seen produced. One thing you will not find there, however, is the latest regarding Ariel's newest project, a musical. She has engaged in preliminary work with female magician of the decade, Arian Black whose research has uncovered the stories of more than 200 female magicians. They will be featured in Ms. Black's upcoming book, whose pages are filled with their amazing historical stories and images. Ariel is excited about the richness and diversity of the women selected for the show. She especially identifies with the heart of the central story, which is inspired by Ms. Black's own life. It's rooted in the love of two sisters who have been divided by life, but become reconciled and reunited through illness, death, and shenanigans of the ghostly ladies of magic. Ariel says of Ariel, she gets it. And says she finds Ariel easy to give notes to, knowing she can trust her to come back with story and characters that meet the standard she is looking for. The show is filled with music, magic, and heart. Keep an eye out for this one, folks. It's going to be absolutely amazing. To keep up on Ariel's work or commission her services, please see her website at www.arielmitchellwriter.com. Thanks for listening. Great, great. Thank you, Susanna. Appreciate it.
Looks like we got some new work happening there as well. Um, all right, let us go to our next and final presenter for today, which is Adrian Centeno. Adrian. Hello, my name is Adrian Centeno, he, him, his, and I'm speaking from the ancestral lands of the Chumash, the Gavrilina Tongvo, the Fernandino, and the Quiche peoples. Uh, I'm, today I'm talking about um, playwright Amanda L. Andre. Amanda L. Andre, she, her, hers, is an award-winning Filipina-Romanian-American playwright hailing from Virginia and currently residing in Los Angeles. Amanda's work considers the body as a site of struggle, in her stories, bodies are marked by technological interventions, by ink, by iron, by skin color, by perceived and actualized notions of gender, race, sexuality, by history, ghosts, creatures, and by actional, actions, intentional and otherwise. This attention to the body is embedded in her artistic process, which she describes as, quote, digging around and finding where it hurts, end quote. Her playmaking is used to diagnose and ultimately provide healing for the characters on stage. And if we're so moved, the work offers us a potential model for our own healing journeys. I first met Amanda through my dramaturgical work at the University of Southern California, where she was at that time a first year MFA student in dramatic writing. A year later, I was invited to serve as workshop dramaturg on her second play, Black Sky. We were already friends at that point, but this collaboration solidified in my mind that Amanda is an artist and thinker crucial to this moment in the American theater. Here, I'll uh, briefly highlight three of her works. Uh, in Black Sky, a dystopian near future where teens are conscripted into a nightmarish version of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and sent to manage climate catastrophe. Amanda invites us to consider what it means to come at, of age in what feels like the beginning of the end. Fierce leader Kay Hawk leads her unit on a routine mission to repair a regional electrical grid in the Appalachian Mountains when suddenly disaster strikes. Was it a solar storm? Maybe a test scenario meant to assess the team's readiness for greater challenges, or perhaps there's a saboteur in their midst. This may sound grim, but it's a credit to Amanda's outstanding work that the piece is as beautiful, funny, and tender as it is existentially haunting. It's also the winner of the 2020 Parody Productions Prize and is currently under option in New York City. In Lena Passes By, an epic fairy tale fantasy, Filipina Romanian American Lena Bala travels to her alien father's homeland of Romania to search for a magical cure that might save him. In one mesmerizing scene shortly after arriving, Auntie Ursa informs Lena that to go on this journey, she'll need to strip herself of the source of her strength, her tattoos. The tattoos connect Lena to her ancestors, who she draws on for guidance in times of trial, and she fears she won't succeed without them. Auntie Ursa asks what she drew strength from in the time before she had the tattoos, to which Lena replies, quote, I've always had them in my skin. The needle and ink just revealed them for everyone else, end quote. One by one, painfully, she strips the tattoos away. She stops short one. She can't bear to part with that one. She offers a compromise, which is accepted, and she ventures into the Romanian forest to seek the heart of a wolf. Finally, Mama, I Wish I Were Silver. Mama, I Wish I Were Silver, commissioned just last year by the Vagrancy in Los Angeles, tells the story of three, soon to be four generations of women in the Remedios family. In the very recent past, we meet Sophia, anxiously entering her third trimester of pregnancy. The, one, the, one thing, the only thing causing her more anxiety is the imminent arrival of her estranged half-sister, Ariel, who is adventurous, independent, and Sophia's senior by 22 years. The two were never close as their mother, Dia, gave Ariel up for around birth for reasons unknown to the two. In the not so recent past, young Dia and her mother debate whether or not they should flee Manila before time runs out. Grandmother and Grandmother insists that Dia must flee for the sake of unborn Ariel, but Dia's commitment to the revolutionary struggle roots her to the Philippine soil like a Nara tree. Before grandmother leaves, she offers Dia maternal wisdom that in the moments between birth and contractions, D 
Dia will slip away to the spirit world to look for her child. Quote, you call her name, you ask her to follow you, you hope that she listens, end quote. There's an urgency in this work to tell the stories of ancestors that they didn't get to share or that were shared but have since been forgotten. To, quote, to close, I'll quote the playwright who said it better than I could. Quote, it's not enough for this to be in a book. These stories have to exist in people's bodies, end quote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate it. Good. There's um, some great playwrights uh, in these presentations. Um, and uh, I uh, appreciate all of you for presenting and, um, and sharing your love of these playwrights. And I uh, look forward to kind of checking out many of these, if not all of these myself. Um, so we had 10 new playwrights shared with you all today, um, including many, many more from um, the presentations uh, from David as well as Jackie. Uh, and I we definitely encourage you and hope that you all, um, you know, find their information and um, check them out. Again, we plan to share some contact information for, um, I hope, all of these playwrights on our conference hub. Um, is, and feel free to reach out to them if you want to see um, their PowerPoint presentations or get more information about many of the others that they've mentioned um, overall. So, so thank you uh, for your um, your time at this uh, your time today. Um, at this point, I want to um, take a moment and see if there are any additional uh, playwrights that people would like to share at this time. Um, um, it, maybe there are some that you have been working with um, over the past uh, a year or so. Um, especially as we are um, watching uh, theaters open up slowly um, over these next few months or so. Um, maybe uh, there are some playwrights that you've been working with during this downtime, but uh, also, um, you know, maybe looking into um, as we um, begin to um, figure out what playwrights should be next. You know, we're seeing a lot of work from um, We've seen a lot of productions that are, you know, obviously kind of bigger productions, more popular productions, but I, I, we definitely want to make sure that we're continuing to support the new playwrights as well um, as we are getting back into the theater and figuring out uh, what kind of shows we want to do. Um, so if you've got any playwrights that you would love to share at this time um, that might be under the radar or just getting some some um, buzz, um, as you heard, a few of our playwrights here have been winning some awards recently um, over the last year or so, um, including, it sounds like Kim um, got one last month. Uh, so, you know, there, it's, you know, uh, please feel free to share that at this time. I'll give you a moment if you want to share that through the chat or Q&A, um, see if um, we get any response that way. If our volunteers or anybody at tiers of any, um, feel free to share. Or if there are others that any of our presenters have in mind that would um, would like to share. Off. I uh, do actually, Brian. Okay. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. Last year I presented George Nelson, and I was saying how his show was opening, but it was delayed obviously because of COVID. But it is launching this summer. So if you go back to last year and look at his one sheet that was provided, you'll be able to see a video clip and um, get the updates on that show that's opening. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, looks like um, Jackie shared uh, info about her playwrights um, in the last, um, oh, in the chat, so that's great. Uh, did you wanna share more, Jackie? Yeah. Yes, a wonderful Philadelphia playwright named Alex Rosenfeld just got accepted into the American, excuse me, American Jewish Theater Conference's um, mentorship program. And so if you're looking especially for uh, Jewish theater, 
I'm going to put her information in the chat box as well. And she will, uh, she actually has support to develop her new Jewish plays, but she doesn't have support necessarily to stage them or anything like that. So I'm sure she'll be looking for producers and other opportunities. Again, that'll be in the chat. That sounds great. Thank you, Jackie. We'll look out for that information. Um, I'm going to share a couple of things I'm seeing in the chat here. Uh, Adrian uh, shared, oh, she, uh, Adrian shared Amanda's uh, NPX info, um, you play exchange info. Uh, Amanda uh, sharing um, her love of the work of Emilio Rodriguez, um, some info there. Um, it's the co founder of Black and Brown Theater Company in the Detroit area. So there's a couple links there to check out there. Uh, and it looks like um, Jihei uh, is mentioned, uh, I think it's Lyra Yang, um, a mixture of mythical nature with storytelling. Um, and there's a, a, a web address, uh, Lyra Nalan, L-Y-R-A-N-A-L-A-N.com. Great, thank you. And there's Alex's info, and um, Susanna shared a link um, from what she talked about as well. Great, thank well, you, everybody. I'd like to say something for a sec, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, one other playwright I'd like to mention is a woman named Caitlin Turnage. Um, Caitlin now teaches at Texas State, but she is an ex-charismatic Christian and writes from that perspective. She writes a lot about faith, and aging, faith and being in high school, faith and being in college, faith and lesbianism. Um, and I don't know anyone who approaches faith A so straightforwardly and B from such a complex position um, because of her own positioning um, in her life. And the work is Southern Gothic in addition to, you know, the subject matter she's handling. It's, I met her when I was dramaturging at KCACTF, um, where she won one of the 10 minute prize, the 10 minute play, which our play was a 19 minute, 10 minute play. Um, but yeah, I don't know anyone who's doing what she does and she does, but she does quite wonderfully. Um, so she's on um, a new play exchange, look her up, Caitlin Turnage, T-U-R-N-A-G-E. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you, Bray. Are you able to put the name in the chat? Great, thank you. All right, um, let's share these last couple um, because we want to give some time for our announcement here at the end. Um, G. Hay uh, mentions uh, her presentation of, uh, I think it's Hey Young Huang um, that um, she presented a couple years ago. Uh, and there's a uh, new play exchange information for that um, playwright. And then Amrita uh, is shouting out Jasmine Sharma, a playwright who recently graduated from Northwestern University. Um, she has a play, uh, Radio Gradient, a political drama that examines the power of complicity through three women's journeys, uncovering the historical roots of a, of a campus hate crime. It had a profound impact on on um, Enrita, and uh, she immediately connected with Jasmine to get to know her and her work more deeply. Uh, continued find she continues to find her plays authentic, nuanced, and filled with memorable three dimensional characters. She sh um, she has a website, uh, jasminesharma.org. Thank you, um, thank you for all of that, Enrita. I appreciate it. Um, uh, let's see, Jackie is mentioning. Um, in Philly in the 2021-22 season, um, uh, Stephanie Kyung Soon Walters uh, has a new play, Esther Choi and the Fish That Drowned, and that'll be produced. Um, uh, looks like in next season. Uh, so if you're in town, um, let Jackie know and she'll get you a comp and she shares information there. Okay. Um, with that being said, let us um, move on um, and I want to give a little bit of time to uh, share an announcement and um, give some time to talk uh, for our um, uh, 
final presenter to talk about a little bit more about it. So uh, I think Jihei is starting the video. So I'm going to let Jihei do that. Thank All you, right. Gee. Hey, I hope that the sound came through for some of you. Uh, but just to reiterate, the LMDA 2022 conference will be in Philadelphia. We are incredibly excited to host all of you here on the traditional lands of the Lene Lenape. Uh, we have already begun putting together resources and program ideas, and we're thrilled to have you join us. Um, a little bit of information about the conference coming up, and this information will also be sent out on the listserv today. So if you want to review it, it'll be there for you. Um, the next LMDA conference will be July 21st through 24th, 2022 in Philadelphia, the traditional lands of the Lene Lenape. And the theme will be theater in the wild performance outside the proscenium. So we're talking burlesque. We're talking cabaret. We are talking a lot of educational theater. We're talking site specific work. We're talking digital theater, all of those wonderful uh, types of performance and more will be covered. Um, I'm going to be the conference chair. I'm Jacqueline Goldfinger. Most of you know me as Jackie G from Philly. Um, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our community. We are working on having English, Spanish, and ASL interpretation available for next year's conference. Um, having all that in kind of interpretation does cost money. We're going to have a packet we send out this fall about conference sponsorships. If you or someone you know or an organization you know uh, you think might want to throw us a little bit of money and be a conference sponsor and get all kinds of special things and benefits. Uh, I hope you'll let us know when the sponsorship packet comes out. Um, for those of you, uh, you know, have may be asking why this area, why on these lands? And um, it's a great vacation location. You can come and do almost anything. There's the historic district. There is traditional performance. There is the Lancaster, beautiful Amish country. Uh, there is, we have a wine valley now, believe it or not. So we will be sending out information about Philly and the surrounding area. If you want to build a vacation around your conference. Um, everything in the old city area, as it's now called, um, is accessible and updated to National Park Service standards. It's one of the great things about having a conference in Philly um, is that because so much of our uh, event spaces are run by the National Park Service, especially in the, the Gold City District, you're going to have all kinds of accessibility, physical accessibility, there's translation headsets, all kinds of things, which are going to be great, and it's easy to maneuver. There are hotels, amenities, um, and it's easy to access from out of town. They're actually expanding our airport right now. It's already an international airport, but they've added two terminals, and we will be coming a Delta Airlines hub as well. So by the time you guys are ready to come in, you're going to be able to fly in from anywhere many, many times a day. Of course, we're also connected to the national highway system, the national rail system, and the buses. And if you're coming from New York, especially, you can get a $3 bus ticket as long as you plan in advance. 
We'll send out those links this fall with our planning packet. What if I can't make it in person? Philly sounds awesome, but I don't know that I can actually physically make it there. Will there still be online content? Yes, yes, yes. I love the accessibility that online content provides. You'll be able to provide, you'll be able to buy a virtual pass to access online resources and a limited number of presentations. Um, we are looking at getting an app specially made for us. So instead of having to deal with 9 million links, you would literally open the app and everything would be there for you when you need it. Super excited. Um, I know the interpreters need a break. I, I apologize. Uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to send out everything today on the listserv. It'll be just a very five page with pictures and some information about what we already have planned for the 2022 conference and a timeline for when you can expect information from us about the conference. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for letting me have this time. Thank you to the interpreters for doing an amazing job. And I will hand it back to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you for the presentation and for the information and look forward to um, the additional info that you'll share on the listserv and in the future as we work on coordinating and organizing the conference for next year. So, uh, all right, with that, um, we are going to uh, wrap things up, but I wanted to take these um, another minute or two to again, thank our presenters uh, during this session. Uh, I want to thank you all for sharing your um, additional playwrights that you all are thinking about at this time. Uh, I want to thank our volunteers and our translators, um, as well as uh, HowlRound for um, for the live streaming uh, today. Um, as I mentioned, most of the, much of this information is going to be on the conference hub. If you are not yet uh, registered for the conference, there is still time to, to get registered. And um, I'm kind of putting on my president hat here, but um, all the information from this session, but as well as all the other sessions that are happening over these next two days. Um, we have a few more today and we have many more tomorrow. Um, uh, will be available for those who register for the conference. So please go to lmda.org and um, register for the conference. There is additionally asynchronous information, uh, a, um, asynchronous content, which has been available throughout this entire month and will continue to be for the rest of this month and maybe a little bit longer um, for those uh, for you to uh, to check that out as well. Um, we also do have our um, conference uh, in Mexico City at the end of the month. Um, and if you are not able to um, join us in Mexico City, um, you can still get access to the um, content that will uh, the presentations that will be happening in Mexico City as well. Um, we will make that available uh, digitally as well. Um, so feel free to register for that uh, as well. With that all said, uh, thank you again for your time um, uh, over this uh, past hour or so. Um, thank you again, presenters and all those who are, have assisted us during this uh, session and will continue to do so throughout this um, throughout this week, um, throughout this weekend, these next couple of days. And um, uh, we look forward to seeing you at future sessions and maybe even um, able to talk to you um, at the various conference uh, happy hours at the end of today and tomorrow. So with that, uh, take care everybody and be well, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.